Mike Lowry for the letter Y. So Mike, um, I'm not going to ask you what you thought about my naming of young novice, but I think you get what I mean. We're talking about style and something I've noticed about your work is you intentionally keep it novice, like, like handmade, like, 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 yeah, just, I just doodled this and voila, I have all these books. How do you get to that point when so many of us are just fretting about making everything perfect? Yeah, you know, I think that some people think that it's a stylistic decision, but actually what happened is in around seventh grade, when it's when I peaked artistically and what you all call, you know, I think I always just liked stuff to be fun and playful and I like working kind of quick. And um, so, you know, no, I went to school and I studied art and all of the stuff that you're supposed to do. But then at some point I realized uh, I liked very playful stuff, but you know, part of it also kind of comes from the fact that, you know, before I even really thought about that there could be a career in art, uh, I wanted to draw newspaper or comic strips. I wanted to draw comics as a kid. And I think that even as I was trying to make my work better over the years, it always kind of fell under that umbrella of making something sort of cartoonish and playful that would work as a comic. So I think Maybe that answers your question. Was your was your question, how did I get so good at making art? Well, first of all, thank you so much for the question. And there's your answer. I was trying not to laugh so that we would be able to see your face while you're talking, but fine. You're just going to make me laugh and I'll just interrupt you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that you have a strong style. You have a strong look. I personally discovered you with the gingerbread man, which I think many people oh, probably wow. did um it's a deep cut that goes that goes pretty far back. yeah sort of, okay. i guess it's cool. the first book actually that i was it's not the first book of mine that came out but it's the first book that i got a contract to do with a big publisher yeah nice no we we loved it and it's kind of a an annual visit for us to read the gingerbread man um but i also have the random facts book is that what it's called give me the right title random illustrated facts yeah there you go. And yeah, it's just, I just, I just enjoy them so much. And I think that there's something to that. I think that having gone to art school and I was a sequential art major or no minor, I was an illustration major, um, got to be like one of the two max girls in those classes. Uh, but I, I understand like how you do also have a knack for developing the story in in that way by looking at like different angles and stuff like that but there's always this element of I could just jump right into this like it just feels so familiar so no I wasn't just your artistic ability I think no more it's questions intention. no I, I it's no. very intentional and I think something that I've I've kind of said to my classes over the years and stuff but something that comes up a lot is early on in my career in doing illustration, I mean, it's, it's a very intentional thing, but early on, um, I was keeping a sketchbook, I was doing these sort of playful drawings, and then the art that I was submitting was very, uh, I guess, kind of dry compared to that stuff. I was trying to make work that looked like other, just what I thought illustration was supposed to be. And I got lucky, I was doing all this vector stuff and uh, like really flat colors and it didn't look like a sketchbook. It didn't look handmade. And I got lucky because an art director actually said to me uh, on a magazine project, she said, um, could we, could we get the final art to look a little bit more like the sketches that you showed, you know, and the sketches is where my work looked better because I had practiced it more because I was keeping a sketchbook all the time. Right. So over the years, I was able to make my final art look uh, I mean, if you saw my sketchbook, it looks like my final art, my sketchbooks are very similar. Yeah. So it's, it's intentional. I had a short stint with vectors too. And then I was like, nah, I'm just going to stick to watercolor. So I feel yeah. Let's talk about your, uh, your sketchbooks. Do you like draw all the time? Cause it kind of looks like that. Yeah. I'm actually drawing right now. Um, <laughs> I like not to move my hands too much cause it would be distracting, but uh, I wish I had my sketchbook in my hand. I could just hold it up. I do draw. I draw all the time. And I think for a while, I, and I go through these stages on what I think that the drawing in a sketchbook is for. And so early on, it was because it was 
just kind of an assignment. I was trying to get better. I was trying to figure out my style and all these other things, which I think I still, that's still a part of it. But mm -hmm. then over the years, there's these windows where it's primarily just about keeping track of my day and things that I'm doing. But also a big part of it is I draw every day because if I don't, I have all these, I, you know, thoughts and uh, these things that I want to keep track of. And if I don't, it's my brain just feels really cluttered. And I think that that's a really artsy thing to say, like I use it as this meditative way to sort of unclutter my brain, but that's become kind of the biggest aspect of it over the last, I don't know, four or five years is that it's just a big part of my routine in that way. So yeah, I do. I am drawing a lot. Yeah. I was going to ask you if it is a routine, like, do you have like a sketchbook time or is it just like, oh my gosh, I just got to get this out. So one of my goals has always been to not have a really specific time or routine or method to keep. I use the same materials typically now because I've been doing it for a while and I have a, a certain kind of certain types of goals with my sketchbook. So I usually use the same kind of pencil or pen every day, but I don't typically draw at the same time unless just my general sort of family and work schedule allows for that time. I mean, some, sometimes little pockets open up and they're the same every day. But I've learned that if I have a specific routine, then if I miss that routine, then I don't make up the time later, if that makes sense. So I, I really try to just work it in kind of in between stuff as much as possible, whether that means so I have a six year old. And so whether that means kind of like waiting at the playground or something like that or doing other things that just sort of require me to be waiting I try to work in sketchbook time then, but typically it's in the morning, but used to, I loved working in my sketchbook anytime after midnight. And now that does not happen as much. <laughs> that was a different person that would do that. So anyway. Could you, so, if you tried, could you become a night owl again, if you tried? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I think for sure I could do it again, but it would take a lot of readjusting, but I I'll tell you one of my absolute favorite times to draw is if we do a family vacation and if I can wake up before the kid wakes up and draw somewhere very early by myself for just a minute, I really like that window. I don't know what it is about that window, but I, I do really like that. So that's a very specific thing, but anyway, it's something I like. Yeah. Like on the three foot porch in the hotel room, like on that patio. Right. Or just, <laughs> uh, I cracked that window because I, for those of you watching, you're not in the United States. They don't let us open windows in hotels here for some reason. So I'll just do the three inch like crack. And then, no, I, I like to go down to the lobby. That's my favorite. Yeah. A little bit of people Watch. watching. It's quiet. Yeah. yeah. That sounds about right. So I, I knew I didn't need to warm you up with any questions because you're used to teaching and you teach a course called Getting Paid to Draw. And you mm -hmm. also do retreats. So in your experience and trying to teach people just how to get paid to draw and how to just draw for fun. What have you found to be just a big hindrance, like something that we always need to get over this little hurdle. And after that, it's gravy. Have you found anything like that? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, I think there's a huge aspect in terms of hurdles. It's going to, it's probably one of the bigger ones is that imposter syndrome or this idea that if you're scrolling through social media and you're seeing other people's posts and everyone is just gen i mean we get the feeling that everyone is generating incredibly solid work all of the time and it's just really not the case and i think that that's one of the reasons why if i'm showing work on social media it's it's typically not going to be the pages where i'm just experimenting and playing around and things don't really necessarily turn out in a way that maybe would be that great Right. And I think that that's what everybody's doing. Right. They're just showing off their best work. If typically, I guess, I don't know, maybe some people just show off everything. But so I think people see a lot of that and then they start thinking that they're no good or that there's already so many people making solid, great work that there's not really a, a place for them. And I think that that's I think that's kind of that's tough. I mean, it's an understandable thing. And I am somebody who has been doing freelance illustration for a pretty long time now. And uh, my wife, Katrin, is also an illustrator. We talk about where we fit into, or, you know, what kind of projects that we want to be doing and that kind of stuff all of the time. I mean, I think everybody gets that feeling of they don't have a feeling for 
what their voice is or their style or these other things that we think we have to have figured out before we can start a career in illustration or even just start a, keeping a daily sketchbook. You think that you have to have all this stuff figured out. And um, I think that a lot of people get really bogged down by that and then they don't really take the next step to kind of get things started. When I felt it really got real was having to write a bio. Yeah. Uh, I do not enjoy writing bios and describing your style and what kind of work you do. Do you have trouble with that at all? Or you just say, hey, I mean, I wish I could just be like, hey, check out my work and we don't have to talk about it. It's cool. Is that? <laughs> yeah, you know, I think I'd love that the... to hear your bio. It's probably like I draw pictures. So, yeah, it's it's gotten real. It's gotten real. I've slimmed it down a lot over the years, right? Because it's also, I think that in certain fields, having a, a specific bio is very important. And then I think in the world of illustration, um, it's maybe less important, but I do think it's important. I think that if you looked at my work, you see a lot about me in the work. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know how intentional that is, but it's definitely a big part of it. And I think that even the kids books that I make and things like that, I mean, there is a kind of a part of me in it um, no, I don't think, I think there's a certain type of person that probably really relishes this idea of sitting down and talking about accomplishments and things that they've worked on. And that's just not my personality. I talk about art and business all the time. And I still, I have a very hard time taking compliments. I have a very hard time, you know, talking about like this thing that I did of an, an accomplishment. And I think that that's okay. I think it's natural to be like that. I think you have to just lean into it a little bit, I guess. So I'm going to flat out ask you, how many books have you illustrated? Have you counted? Uh, now I have to talk about myself. No, I'm just, <laughs> I have That's what we're here on, for, Mike. <laughs> I know. Let's just do it. I have worked on over 80, but I don't remember the, I don't know because there's been, I checked it out recently and it was like 84, I think. So, but I don't know where it's at now. Somewhere between 85 and 95, somewhere right there. So what is your most recent project coming out that we can look forward to? So my most recent project were some Halloween decorations that I made with my six year old. No, that's not. I think you probably mean more like professional, but that was probably my Something favorite. Something we can see would be great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't drive by my house. They're already taken down. Uh, but I just recently finished a book with Scholastic called Santa Shark. And this is a book about a shark that's getting ready for a special visitor. And uh, I'll, I'm going to tell you real quick how that book came to be, because that, that, maybe that's kind of interesting to somebody watching. I work. Yeah. And that way you won't spoil it for us, too. I like, can't. I won't tell the you story. There might be something Christmas related. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, here's the backstory for it. And I'll, I'll give you the quick version. So for a, around three years, maybe a little bit less, I worked on this series of books called Everything Awesome. And these books were a big collection of all of the facts and jokes and things about specific topics. The first one was about dinosaurs. And then I did one about sharks. And then I did one about space stuff. Mm -hmm. So I really liked working on those books, but they were absolutely massive projects that required a lot of research and uh, a ton of drawing and writing and things like that. So after I finished the shark book, which again, it's all true stuff. It's all real. It's a nonfiction book about sharks. After I finished that book, around the holidays, uh, the publisher asked if I would make a promo for it. And I think they were sort of hoping for a bunch of shark facts and, you know, other things that I would research and look into. But instead of doing all of that work, I just drew a shark in an ugly Christmas sweater. And I you know, said, happy holidays. And they were fine with it. No, they liked it. They thought it was funny. I thought it was funny. And what I realized was I kind of wanted to take a break from all of that heavy duty nonfiction stuff and then just tell a story that played up the other part of writing that I like. I like research. I like writing, you know, nonfiction stuff, but I mm -hmm. wanted to do a project that played up these other things that I really like, which is, I apologize. It, it's puns. I really like puns a lot. And I like big, silly, friendly characters. Okay. And I like to pair those big, silly, friendly characters with a character who's not totally convinced, you know, about the thing that we're excited about, because it's like two parts of my personality together. Anyway, so after working on that big nonfiction book, I started drawing this silly shark character wearing an ugly sweater. I started thinking of, you know, why is he wearing this sweater? And then slowly I came up with 
Santa Shark, a, a book about a shark just waiting for the holidays. Boom. I uh, feel like you, you're you kind of doing like a pendulum swing where you're like deep nerd mode into, I just want to draw silly things. And then somewhere in the middle, you find your sweet spot. Oh, fair? for sure. Yeah. And I think most of my books tend to have both of those things in it. But I think for me to stay uh, interested in the thing that I'm doing, this is stuff that takes a lot of time. You know, a book might take a year to work on. The Gingerbread Man book, I mean, from the time I got the manuscript to the time it was on the shelves, it was, I mean, it was around three years. So, I mean, that's a long time to be with something. So, uh, yeah, so I think that I just have to kind of shift things around a little bit sometimes to kind of stay excited about them. Mm -hmm. And I can see that with illustrating books and teaching and who knows, are you still taking editorial work? I do sometimes I'm working on something now. It's funny you ask. Yeah, but uh, not as much because, you know, it sometimes it pulls away from starting a few years ago. I started incorporating a lot more writing into my daily process. I talk about drawing all the time. I talk about writing a little bit, but um, it, it's because I had to kind of figure that out more as I sort of grew into that world a little bit. I I went to school for art. I practiced art. I draw every single day, but writing was the thing that I always really loved, but that I've had to kind of learn how to make it a part of my routine. So I've learned that sometimes you have to kind of focus on something for a little bit to kind of make sure you're getting it right. If that makes, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. So, so I'm going to have an Oprah moment. Here Do you feel go. like your uh, imposter syndrome comes up in your author mode more so than your artist illustrator mode? Um, how can I put this? Uh, let's say 1000%. So <laughs> absolutely. I think the illustration thing is the thing. When I said I've worked on all those books, those are all books that I've illustrated. And some of those I've written and illustrated. And at this point, I've written more books. But yeah, absolutely. I think the imposter mode, I think still I handed in uh, a, a manuscript that I handed in recently. I mean, Santa Shark even, which I wrote and illustrated. Um, you know, you don't have to clap every time I mention a book that I both wrote and illustrated, even though it was a lot. Of, you don't we are, we are. I just, I just really want the camera to be on you here on. on yeah, I understand. I understand. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that um, even with a book like that, I think I'm, I love it when I get really specific feedback. You know, I think if somebody says, oh, this is great, then I'm thinking like, did they, are they really paying attention to it? You know, but I love it. I love getting really detailed feedback. And, um, you know, that was one when I sent it off that I was thinking, oh man, is this, they're going to read it and they're going to be like, oh, he tricked us. He tricked us uh, when we, you know, or whatever, you know what I'm saying? And I, and, but I'm also really lucky because I share uh, my house, my studio, and you know, my wife is a, uh, is a children's book illustrator and she's this award-winning, really great children's book illustrator. So I'm really an, an author. So I'm lucky that at least there's a level between me and my editor and between me and my agent where I can kind of show her this and get her approval before I take it to the next stage. <laughs> I like that. My my husband does the same thing to me, but I think sometimes he's like, I think I'm just going to keep this quiet because I don't need another voice in my head. <laughs> so I'm sure it's a dance. But if I were to look at your work and give it thoughtful feedback, it would come from the place of like people look at abstraction and simplifying shapes or simplifying at all as something is so easy. And I know that actually what looks pretty easy is actually pretty tricky and difficult and really hard to hang on to with all the, I don't know, like you were talking about the, the pressure, the, should it be more this? Should it be more that? And so you keep it alive. And I, I, I just, I always want to tease at how artists stoke that fire because from the outside, it looks like, you know what you're doing. You know, everybody looks that way, right? Um, or a little more polished than we really are, but it's a lot of experimentation. We don't see the rough drafts. I think you were yeah. alluding to that. Sure. Um, and we probably don't really even appreciate our own work, but that's kind of a beautiful thing. I think it's fun that you're humble and and have a dry sense of humor. I can dig it. 
So. Well, I appreciate that. You know, and I think that what I, you know, it's interesting because I've heard this before where I, if I'm doing a drawing demo or something, I go straight to pen a lot. And I think that there are people that are, you know, very surprised by that. But, you know, I think it's just like anything else where it is the thing that I am the probably in my life the most practiced at. And I, if I don't work in a sketchbook for, um, I mean, even just a few days, then I can tell when I go to draw, I, I am way less confident in knowing what I want to draw and where I want to get started on a page in my sketchbook. And that just comes from even just taking a few days away from it. And so I think for people that are not used to keeping a regular routine like that, mm -hmm. it probably feels fairly impossible. Whereas for me, I'm making very simplistic drawings. And I think that they're, you know, the stories that I'm writing, especially in my journal or sketchbook, they're really very simplistic to me. And so I think that that confidence just comes from keeping a regular sketchbook routine. And, it, you know, to sound sort of teacherly just for a second, it is, I mean, keeping a sketchbook is 100% the reason that I have a career in illustration. I found you know, the, my voice there, my way of drawing, the materials that I like to use. And I was lucky that I was started keeping a sketchbook in a stage where I didn't feel any pressure to post on social media because there wasn't social media. And, um, you know, that's something that came later. And I, so I feel lucky that I had this long time of just kind of making work and getting it wrong and then slowly finding very small pieces that I liked. And then eventually it turned into you know, this handwriting basically for me now, this way that I work a lot. So I think it just comes from, okay, all that to say, keep a sketchbook. <laughs> I, I I would say like an underlying thread is like, you're like committed, you're committed to your sketchbook. And at some point you commit to, this is what I do. And you mm. keep in it, keep walking in that. Um, and then also change your mind sometimes. All the time. And I think that it's constantly evolving. I think that if I needed to draw, I don't know, some monument right now there that I've never drawn before, I would have to kind of reevaluate the way that I do something. And I might have to draw it six or seven times before I get it right. It's not just, oh, you find this way of working, which people call your style. You find this way of working. And then now every time I sit down and make those marks, that's the way it looks. It doesn't, it's not like that for anybody. It's just, I've rehearsed a little bit more my way of doing things. And so sometimes that looks like confidence, but I, I can assure you there's, I mean, it's just me pretending to be confident. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, but you, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's a great, that's a great thought to end on. Cause I feel like there's always going to be a tension of confidence and lack of it. And I think that that makes us great humans and creatives to communicate that somehow. In some way. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for your time, Mike. Um, to find Mike, I will tell you where to find him. You yeah. will look at his website, mikelowry.com, and also on Instagram. And check out his, how many books again? 80, 80 plus, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Yeah, 80, 80 plus books and his course, if you're interested in getting paid to draw. Try your hand at this style with a very lesson targeted to do so. Explore this one and so many others in Watercolor Bold. Try it out for free and learn as much as you can. Thanks, Mike. All right. Thanks so much. See you next time. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do it next time.